Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah ta'ala wa barakatuhu. This is again Sadiq Abdul Malik. Uh, first I give all praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for bringing me to this deen of Islam. Uh, I will try to make this video short as it is an add-on to the other two videos that I did uh, concerning terror under the shade of the cross. So I'll make this short because I understand that a couple people died of hunger listening to the video, waiting for me to finish. So I want to immediately state that I'll try to make this short. I want to address two points very quickly. And one of these points is that I made in, the, in video number two, I want to address a point that I made at 122 of the second video, at a minute and 22 seconds of the second video, which lasted to uh, the four, four minute and six second mark. It had to do with the prophecy of Jesus Christ, where he said that John was Malachi. I mean that John was Elijah, and because the Jews were waiting for two messiahs. So uh, Jesus Christ said that John was, was Elijah. Eli uh, John uh, denied it three times, and I explained it or just referred to the video. Uh, but I want to add to that. Um, the way that the Christians try to explain and say that John was Elijah and reconciled it, besides having uh, uh, promoted the idea that he was dressed as Elijah in the suit of hair, and that uh, you know he was Elijah reconciling the family, father to son, son to father, and things like this, um, that they said that he was Elijah because he was reconciling the family. And I explained that in the second video at the 122 mark, beginning in the, in the second video. But I want to add to that. The way that they say that this can happen is through the process of baptism. That this is how the healing of the family would happen. Because John was called John the Baptist. So the, through the action of baptism that this is how John partook of the, the, the healing of the family. Again, wrong. Why? Because baptism is no part of the Judaic religion. Baptism is no part of how a Jew becomes a Jew or in the Bible how you become a believer. The process of being a believer in the Bible was through circumcision. This is how you become a believer. You will be circumcised. Baptism was started and began from a pagan practice of the worship of the god Dionysius and also stemming from the Eleusian mystery religions that has its tentacles deep inside the religion of Christianity. Mysticism, mystery has its tentacles deep inside the religion of Christianity, and this is where baptism came. The genesis of it, of it began, if we want to look at it historically, is in year 167 BCE with King Antiochus IV of, of the Seleucid Empire, who then made, compelled the Jews, out of his anger, compelled the Jews to accept baptism, to accept the God, I mean Dionysius. The worshippers of the God Dionysius baptized themselves to purify themselves and for the forgiveness of sin. So it came from the worship of Dionysius. This is where baptism came from, purely and completely pagan practice. From this, some of the Jews in the area where uh, Antiochus the Port compelled these people in the year 167 BCE to take on the religion of, of, of Dionysius, some of these people then Jews in the diaspora and Alexandria adopted this concept of baptism. Among those were those who were called the Essenes. Some of them did not, but among those that did were the Essenes. And the Essenes lived in the area of Qumran. And these Essenes, it is reputed and believed that John the Baptist was an Essen. And John the Baptist baptized, not according to the God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but according to the the SN paradigm or the Dionysian paradigm of baptism. This is uh, stated by Josephus in book number 18 of the Antiquities of the Jews. It is also stated by Tertullian, a defender of the church, of the Christian church, an ardent defender of the Christian church, Tertullian, who stated in a book or the writing called De Baptismo, okay, um, prescription against the heretics, where he admits. He admits that the, that the baptism is a pagan practice, but that their idea of, of baptism was closer to God than the pagan practice of the worshippers of Dionysius and the people who followed the Eleusian mysteries. Um, so let me just add that. So then it is impossible then 
for Elijah to use that mode of reconciliation for the family because number one, it was pagan. Number two, it started in the year 167 BCE with King Antiochus, Antiochus IV of the Seleucid Empire. And number three, Malachi predated that by hundreds of years. He had no idea of the concept of baptism and baptizing people to, uh, to, for forgiveness of sin and to be reborn. And he had no idea that that was a vehicle used to reconcile the family. That was unknown to Elijah. Unknown. He had no way of, of accepting or doing or putting into practice something that was pagan that came hundreds of years after he left the earth. And Elijah will return, remember, according to your Bible, Elijah will return bodily because he was taken up bodily in the whirlwind and he will return in his form. The second point that I want to address very quickly, I hope you understood that because I'm trying to hurry. I don't want to burden you. Is the area of, of statement that I made it in the second video at the 51, point, 51 minute 28 second mark lasting to the 55 minute and 51 second mark where I spoke about pre-Islamic era and the warlike tendency of the Arab during the pre-Islamic times. Um, and I named, I got the, them correct, but I made some names, I got some names confused. The first one that I cited, I said Abbas and Taglib. No, it was not Abbas, Taglib was correct. It was not uh, Abbas, it was Bani Bakr and Taglib. The second war was between um, Abbas, it was Abbas in the second one, Abbas and the one that I could not remember was Duhubian, the tribe of Duhubian. The third, of course, I got completely correct with no mistakes, which was, which was Al-Aus and Khazraj. Let me explain and go to the first two uh, which I cited. The war between Bani Bakr and Abbas between, I mean, Bani Bakr and Taglib started over a she-camel. It seems that a man by the name of Jarmi had a she-camel. Next to him, his next door neighbor was a woman by the name of Basus bin, uh, bint Manqad, Manqad. And she was the aunt of a man by the name of Jasas bin Murah. Jasas bin Murah was the chief of the tribe of Taglib. It seems that the, 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 the she-camel of Jarmi wandered into the flock of camels owned by a man by the name of Kalib. Kalib, upon seeing this camel, upon seeing this camel, took out his bow and arrow and killed the camel and slaughtered it. Instead of these two men getting together and talking over compensation and talking over a resolution and payment to this problem, they did not contact each other and hatred was built up. Anger then was built up because of this no contact, where Jarmi became extremely, increasingly angry. His neighbor, his neighbor Basul's uh, bint uh, Manqad became angry, and of course her nephew, uh, Jasas ibn Murah, became extremely angry, and he was the chief of the tribe of Taglib. So when no solution came about, uh, Jasas bin al Marah went to Kalib and instead of talking over solution, he killed him. This started a war of over 40 years between the tribe of Bani Bakr and Taglib. A war of 40 years, bloody, 40 years between Bani Bakr and Taglib. And over one she camel. The second one that I cited was the war between Abbas and Duhubian. Duhubian was the tribe that I could not remember. And I named Bani Bakr in a second, uh, wrongly. Uh, it, was Bani, it was Abbas and Duhubian. And in that war, the second uh, in, uh, example that I, that I cited, the war between Abbas and Duhubian, uh, it started over two racehorses. And the day that the war started, it was called the day of, of Dahis and al Abra. The horse Dahis was owned by a man by the name of Qais bin Zahir. The horse al Abra was owned by a man by the name of Hudhaifa, Hudhaifa ibn Badr. Hudhaifa 
even by the, was the horse, uh, the owner of the horse Al Qabra. Um, Hudhaifa uh, ibn Badr left instructions with one of his tribesmen that if he saw the, ho the horse Dahis winning, that he was to intervene so that his horse Al Qabra could win. Lo and behold, that is precisely what happened. As it came into a certain area, the horse of Dahis, which belonged to Qais bin Dahir, was winning. The man intervened and the horse Dahis fell into a river, thereby allowing the horse Al Qabra, which was owned by Hudayfa ibn Badr, to take the lead and win the race. At the end of the race, they found out wait a minute, this is cheating. And a war was begun, bloody long war that lasted a long time with the loss, loss of many lives, much money, over two horses. And again, it was say, it was called the War of Dahis and al Qabra. And the third war, I explained correctly. I mean, the third, I explained it. I didn't make no mistakes in the names of the tribes. It was al Aus and Khazraj. Now, one of the things that is very interesting about that war is I explained it correctly. Um, you get a very important aspect because al Aus and al Khazraj were very important to Islam because, as I said before, they were the Ansar. They became the Ansar, they welcomed the Prophet Muhammad. These two tribes, Al Aus and Khazraj, before the coming of the Prophet, used to live in peace at one time. They migrated, escaping the, escaping the floods of Arim, and they migrated into the area of Medina, which was called Yathrib at that time. Also, at that, at that very same time, migrated out of Israel and Jerusalem, Bait al Maqdis. The tribes of Banu Nadir, Banu Kainuga, and Banu Khureza, the Jewish tribes. And they came in all at the same time. They lived in peace for a bit. And then they began to war with each other. And it was very funny because Al Aus and Al Khazraj uh, descended from the same line. They came from the same line, the same lineage. Both tribes were descended from a man by the name of Haratha. Ibn Haratha ibn Thalab al Asdi. They both descended from the same line. And the man that they descended from, again, was Haratha bin Thalab al Asdi, was his name. But they fought. They fought. And all the tribes, the Jewish tribes and the two Arab tribes, fighting against each other. The Arab tribes, and the Jewish tribes, and after a while, like they are today, the Yahud, very smart. And when it goes back to what I'm talking about in the, in, in, in the uh, video, knowing how to play the ends against the ends, um, the Jewish tribes then made separate deals with each tribe, al Aus sometimes and Khazraj, where they would maintain the two tribes of Arabs fighting each other, while they themselves, Banu Nadir, Banu Khainuga, and Banu Khareza, maintained a position of strength, while the two tribes, and unity, while the Arab tribes were fighting against each other. This came to an end when the, the tribes of Aus and Khazraj decided that we cannot continue to fight like this. So they came to an agreement where they would make a common leader, choose a common leader among them. That common leader that they chose to lead them and to bring peace and to unite them was none other than Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salur. But it just so happened that it was at that time that the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made hijrah from Mecca into Medina with the Mujahirun. And he was then made the undisputed leader of Medina and Islam became the rule of the people and the rule of the day in al Medina. So Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul was kicked out. He, did never, he never became the leader that he wanted to be. He had anger. He had animosity because he wanted that position of power. So he never got it. This is why he became the leader of the Mujahirun and the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In a time when the nation of Islam was at its beginning, at its most weakest point, because every baby when it's born it is weak until it grows up. Islam at Medina at its weakest point in the beginning of Islam in al Medina, when it was still formulating itself and developing its strength, it had a cancer within it and it was called Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sarul and the hypocrites. And the Prophet Wasallam treated Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sarul with great kindness. Though, the, though Abdullah bin Ubay bin Sarul never stopped uh, 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 
planning and scheming against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet treated him with great kindness. And the Quran says, and give them a word that they may come to truth. Give them a word that they, a word of truth that they may come to understand. The Quran says. So the Prophet treated him that way. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this man did many things against the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul that, did, that started the al ifq against Aisha radiallahu anha, accusing her again, I'll repeat, of having an illicit relationship with a man by the name of Safwan bin Mu'atil bin Sulami al dakhwani It was he, the one that started that. Unfortunately, it was not only him and the hypocrites, three Muslims who were good, went along with the al ifq but the thing was that they were forgiven while Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul was not. But the three Muslims who went along with it was Hamna bin Jash. Hamna bin Jash was the sister of Zainab bin Jash. She had jealousy toward Aisha. The second one was a man by the name of Hassan bin Thabit. Hassan bin Thabit. And the other man was Mr. bin Uthatha bin Abad bin Al Mutalib, who Abu Bakr Sadiq was taking care of. And these three Muslims went along with the al ifq perpetrated by Abdullah Ubay bin Salul and the Prophet Sallallahu again treated him with great kindness. Though he sought that he be punished, he never killed him nor punished him for that. Um, another thing that he did, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul also withdrew his soldiers from the battle of Uhud. 300 of his men withdrew, withdrew them from the battlefield, leaving the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, I believe, with only 700 men to face the Quraysh in battle. Leaving them with only 700. That is cowardice in the face of the enemy. In pre-Islamic times, during Islamic times, after Islam and on into today, as stated in the UCMJ, UCMJ, the Universal Code of Military Justice of the United States of America, is how soldiers are guided, the law of the soldier. If you turn your back on your enemy and run from your enemy and leave your boys, your men, in a state where they can be overrun and killed and you run, you are subject to being killed in the Universal Code of Military Justice in the United States of America, as well as the rule of military codes of justices throughout the armies of the entire world. You are subject to death, but Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did nothing to him. Okay? Another thing that Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul did. Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, uh, 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 this is Surah Tawbah verse 74, Surah Tawbah verse 74, which is, which is said, it is related about a man by the name of Al-Julas bin Suwayd As-Samit. Okay, who was married to the, to the, to the mother of one um, Umar bin Saad. He was married to the mother of Umar bin Saad, and Umar bin Saad was his stepson. Umar bin Saad loved Abdullah bin Ubay, uh, loved Al Julas bin Suwayl as Samit, and respected him for taking care of him, his stepson. But he had overheard uh, uh, Al Julas bin Suwayl as Samit say, he overheard. Him say, Abdullah, uh, uh, Al-Julas bin Suwayd as samit he heard him say, if what Muhammad said is true, then we are nothing, then we are no more, then we are worse than donkeys. That was the statement. If what Muhammad said is true, then we are worse than donkeys. This was the statement of hypocrisy. So, Umar bin, Umar bin Saad went to uh, uh, to, the, to uh, his, his stepfather and he said I have much to thank you for and I in a way love you actually that's not the exact words I'm just putting in my words and I would hate for any harm to befall you but what if I expose what you said it will expose you and if I withhold what you said it will destroy me. Surely, one evil is worse than the other. And he went to tell the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when uh, Al Julas bin Suwayd as Samit found out, he went to the Prophet to deny. That's when the ayah 974 was revealed. And they swear that they said nothing bad or nothing wrong. And, that's, and then when this was told, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam answered, uh, Al Julas bin Suwayd as Samit with that ayah in the Quran, it is said that he repented 
and his, his repentance was accepted, and he left the, the notion of hypocrisy. Now, according, okay, but that's explaining one aspect of the tafsir. The other aspect of the tafsir, according to the, to the, to the, uh, to the people of knowledge, is that Ayah 974 also relates to Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. Because you see, was the followers of Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, they tried to kill even the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on his way from Tabuk in the area of Al Aqaba. Twelve men tried to do this. And the Prophet, when they came after Prophet, at the valley of Al Aqaba, the Prophet screamed out and they ran away. To cut a long story, a long story short, it was Hudayfa ibn al Yaman radiallahu anhu who was holding the bridle of the Prophet's horse who the Prophet revealed who these men were. Who the Prophet revealed to who these men were. And that way uh, Hudayfa ibn al Yaman became known as the man of the holder of the secrets. And the Prophet never took out any vengeance against Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. And in fact Look at all the things that he did. And in fact, uh, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, when he died, his son went to the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to ask that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam perform the dinaza or the funeral prayer on the hypocrite um, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. Now this is in Surah 80, I mean Surah Tawbah verse, Surah Tawbah verse 80. Where it says that even if you ask for 70 times, Umar, then he accepted, the Prophet وسلم, accepted to do so. Because he was approached to do this by the son of Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, a man by the name of a, a man by the name of Hubab bin Abdullah. Hubab bin Abdullah. When the son of the Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul came to the Prophet and solicited him to do the funeral prayer, he asked him, What is your name? He said, My name is Hubab bin Abdullah. The Prophet وسلم, said to him, No, you shall not be known as that. The name Hubab is the name of the devil. From now on, you shall be known as Hubab bin Abdullah. I mean, uh, Abdullah bin Abdullah. Excuse me. So the Prophet told him the name Hubab was a moniker or name of the devil, that he from that moment on would be known as Abdullah ibn Abdullah. And the Prophet consented to do Jizanaza prayer at the at the uh, protest of Umar and did the funeral prayer and in fact lent uh, to the son who became now Abdullah bin Abdullah, the son of Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul, gave him his kamis in order to bury um, Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul. So Alhamdulillah, it's a very interesting story. Uh, so I just wanted to clear that up. Again, the first sighting was not uh, the first and the correct uh, uh, interpretation uh, of the first one was the first war of pre-Islamic times and the pension of the pre-Islamic Arabs for violence and war was the first one was Bani Bakr and Taglib. The second was Abbas and Duhubian. Let me just say one very quick thing before I end this tape. The Arabs had many tendencies that were less than nice, let us say. But they had the tendencies that made them fit for carrying this deen of Al-Islam. Their love for truth, their hate of subjugation, their love, uh, hatred of subjugation and oppression and love of freedom, their honesty, their memory, their kindness, their persistence, their perseverance of times of hardship, so even though they had those many bad tendencies, they had the tendencies that allowed them to take this Islam, form the foundation, and bring it on until the eternal moment where we will receive from Allah judgment until the last day of this earth. They were fit to carry this message because of the good qualities that they had. And let me give you an interesting story about love of truth and honesty. I can give you two examples. Number one, Abu Sufyan, of course. Abu Sufyan, when he went to Heraclius with some of the Quraysh, 
with a contingent of Quraysh concerning the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Here is an example of truth and their holding on to truth and honesty. Um, he was asked by Heraclius to describe Muhammad ibn Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He could have lied as lying would have helped him in his goal, what he was sent there for. It would have facilitated it to uh, discredit the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa But instead he chose to tell the truth. And he later states that he told the truth for fear that his companions would know him as a liar and his people would say of him that he was a liar. So he told the absolute truth about Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though that truth worked against his stated goal for going to Heraclius in the first place. He still chose to tell the truth, a quality of truth that was beloved among the Arab. The second thing, and the second example of that, is a beautiful example, and it's the example of a man, again, going back to, uh, going back to the war between uh, Bani Bakr and Taglib, a long war. Another example of truth and honor, which are very important and beautiful qualities and virtues, not only with Abu Sufyan, but with a man by the name of Harith bin Ibad. Harith bin Ibn Ibad was chosen to lead an expedition or an army against the tribe of Taglib. But not only was he chosen, this man, Harith bin Ibad, had an alternative, alternative reason for wanting to fight against Taglib besides their natural hatred of each other. You see, his other reason was to avenge the death of his son, who was killed a year earlier by the chief of Al-Taglib, uh, Al a man by the name of Mun al mulhalhal Ibn Rabia who was the chief of the tribe of Taglib, who a year earlier had killed his son. So now he was given the, the honor of leading an army against Taglib, and he had a personal reason also to avenge the death of his son. So the battle happened. After the battle, uh, Haratha ibn Ibad takes a man prisoner. Now, Haratha ibn Ibad had never seen al muhalhal bin ibn Rabia. Never seen him. So when he took this man as prisoner, he says to him, if you take me to al muhalhal ibn Rabia and lead me to him or point him out to me or take me to him, I will set you free. I will set you free. The prisoner then said to uh, Haratha ibn Ibad, you mean if I tell you where al muhalhal ibn Rabia is? You will set me free? He said, yes. The prisoner said, do I have your word, your oath, and your promise that you will do so? Haratha ibn Rabiyat said, Rabiyat said, uh, Haratha ibn Ibad said, yes. Then the prisoner said, well, in that case, I am al-muhalhal ibn Rabiyah. Now remember, remember that the, those tribes went to war over any reason over a camel spitting or breaking wind, over any reason, trivial reason they went to war. Imagine avenging the death of a son, where sons were counted as extremely important, worth their weight in gold in pre-Islamic uh, society. Imagine that. But instead of Haratha ibn Ibad standing up and killing this man immediately, because remember, they went to war for horses and for camels, for a race, and because one she camel was killing him. War could be for any reason. Imagine the sun, again I repeat. So instead of killing him, he got up calmly, unloosened the shackles of his prisoner, and let him go. Truth, honor, and keeping of oaths. Qualities that would be very important in continuing and bringing to fruition this deen of Islam. A very beautiful example of that. Uh, we even have another one more example that I will cite of the 
aspect of honor, truth, trustworthiness, and living to old is the example of a man by the name of al noman Ibn al mundhir who went, who denied marrying his daughter to the king Kisra. He would not allow his daughter to marry the king Kisra or the emperor Kisra. And he feared the emperor because of this. So he left his family, his daughter, his family, his, his wife, family and wealth in the care and trusteeship of a man by the name of Hani bin Masood al-Shaybani. Hani ibn Masood al-Shaybani. And he left with him the care of his family and his wealth to take care for him. While he went back to the Emperor Kisra, who he feared very much, and the Emperor treated him badly. When the Emperor found out, found out that Hani bin Masood ibn al-Shaybani had the wealth and family of uh, al noman bin al-Mundhir, he demanded that he give over the daughter and his family and wealth over to the king. Hani ibn Masood al-Shaybani said no. The king then sent, threatened to send an army to kill him and to destroy the tribe of Bani Bakr. So he had the choice. He said, man, you know, this is somebody else's daughter. You know, I'm not going to sacrifice a whole tribe, trust my life and my family over this person. But remember, he gave his word. This was about his word, his honor and his oath. So he appealed to the tribe of Bani Bakr and he said, oh, my people, oh, Bani Bakr. It is better. He is superior who dies with, a, with an excuse than one who runs away from the battlefield. For verily, caution does not dissuade preordainment, qudr. Caution does not affect preordainment or qudr of Allah. And it is indeed true that patience is a cause of victory. So therefore I say to you, I say yes to death. I say yes to death and no to baseness and humiliation. For it is better to be stabbed in the upper chest facing your enemy than to be stabbed in the back running away from your enemy. Oh, Bani Bakr, fight, fight, for death will come to us all anyway, subhanAllah. So he could have chosen the easy way out to save his people and save his family and save them a war against a powerful king and emperor. But he chose to keep his word and follow his honor and his belief in truth. And Bani Bakr fought and defeated the king, the emperor Kisra, defeated the, the, the Persian army. They were Persian. And he defeated them. So these are just two examples. Um, so I just wanted to again, I think those are very beautiful stories. And I just wanted to uh, clear that up about what I had stated at those points of the second uh, video. Um, and I think that covers it in detail. Uh, so I'll say now with that, Muslim, Alhamdulillah, be proud of who you are. Do not be proud to the point of arrogance, but be proud in a state of gratefulness and thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for sending his prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and this deen of Islam to you. The honor, the pride that I talk about is in the form of gratefulness for Allah loves the grateful slave. Live your Islam. Speak your Islam. Concentrate on the character of the Muslim, which is based on the character of the greatest human being that has ever stepped foot on this earth, the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Be grateful and give thanks for this great gift. For you, it says in the Quran, are the greatest people of all for mankind, for you enjoin righteousness and forbid the evil. 
And here in the United States, we have an example because the greatest, most righteous, most law-abiding, God-fearing, and best migration that has ever come to the United States so I is the most of those examples of the pre-Islamic era, the era of the tribes, the pre-Islamic tribes, show you some of the virtues that they had that made them incredibly fit to bear this gift of Islam upon their shoulders, to allow it then to come into fruition into the future. Those virtues which I cited of truth, honor, faithfulness, and I did not cite another beautiful example of their hatred of uh, subjugation and love of freedom, which is uh, an example which I could have cited by a man by the name of uh, Amr bin Khulthum, who was, a, who was a poet, a poor poet, who in the pre-Islamic era, era was before a king by the name of Amr bin, uh, Amr bin Hind. And the situation that happened there about love of freedom and hatred of oppression, where he ended up killing this man, Amr bin Hind. This is a very far out example, very drastic example, but it shows the love of freedom and the hatred of subjugation, where he killed this king by the, by the name of Amr bin Hind, who was the king of Hira, and he killed him uh, because of the attempt to subjugate him and to belittle his mother into a position of servitude and slavery. And that's the story of Amr bin Khulthum and Amr bin Hind, uh, which I did not go into. And we'll leave it at that. Concerning Surah uh, Tawbah verse 80, where it said that the Prophet ﷺ prayed for the hypocrite Abdullah bin Ubay bin Salul at the request of uh, Hubab bin Abdullah, who the Prophet renamed Abdullah ibn Abdullah. That ayah was later abrogated in ayah 84, where the Prophet then was completely prohibited from praying the janazah for the hypocrite. So I just wanted to make that clear for my Muslim brothers out there who have a very discerning eye and who have an eye which is alhamdulillah geared toward preserving the authenticity of Islam. So it is for them that I clear this up. Ayah 80 was then abrogated in Ayah 84 of Surah Al-Tawbah. So with that, I would like to say to my Muslim brothers and sisters, Alhamdulillah, be proud of who you are. Continue to exhibit the character of the Muslim. For it said in the Holy Quran that you are the best people of all for mankind, for you enjoy righteousness and forbid the evil. And that is absolutely true, absolutely true. An example is here in the United States of America. For the migration of Muslims that has come to the United States, I can say unequivocally, is the greatest, most law-abiding migration that has ever come to the United States of America in its entire history. So be proud of that. Also be proud of the fact that you're Muslims but expect, uh, express that pride, not in arrogance, and not in thinking that you're better than anyone else. No, not in that, not in arrogance of thinking or believing that you're better than anyone else. Because the Prophet prohibit, the Prophet Wasallam completely prohibits that, as you well know. But express that pride in the form of thankfulness and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for choosing you, my Muslim brothers and sisters, to be Muslim and to follow the example of the greatest person that has ever stepped foot on this planet Earth, the Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So with that, my most beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah ta'ala wa barakatuh.